Drinking Buddies. I had the wonderful opportunity to interview Nick Taylor, one of the founders at Found North, to learn all about the brand, how their sourcing works. I, we got really nerdy into the whiskey category, so you whiskey nerds out there are going to love it. Uh, so the audio of this video is going to be that interview, and the video of this video is going to be a bunch of bourbon hunts I've done around. So if you like bourbon hunts, stick around for that. If you like awesome interviews with guys who know their whiskey way better than I do, you'll be wanting to stick around for that. Let's go. I'm your drinking buddy. All right, cool. So I'm joined here by Nick uh, from Found North, and he wanted to tell us a little bit about his brand. Yeah, awesome, man. Thanks for having me. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm excited to uh, chat with you. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited, too. I'm, I've uh, found that what you guys are doing is really cool. Uh, you know, I mean, sometimes with the non-distiller producers, there's a little bit of an issue with, like, transparency, and you guys are really transparent on the labels, and I think that's really cool. Yeah, we we try to be. Uh, it's it's a little unfortunate um, for us not not being able to reveal um, sources most of the time. Uh, for the most part, the distillers in Canada won't send us samples without an NDP. Yeah. Um, so we don't we we uh, <laughs> an NDA. <laughs> yeah. Uh, without a non disclosure agreement. Uh, uh, so you know we we. Uh, we try to basically reveal as much as possible about um, how we make it, what goes into it, um, what we did to the components themselves. So if we're, if we're doing any any further maturations on our own, um, any regaging, any recasting, um, we try to make that we try to make that available on the website. And then um, in conversation, we'll we'll kind of discuss uh, everything we've done um, in large part because I mean we we. We're an interesting group in terms of our backgrounds. Um, so most of the team, actually the entire team, uh, worked on the consumer-facing side of the business, mm -hmm. uh, of the whiskey business first, which is unusual. Most people who produce whiskey got into production early. Um, you know, wh whatever that was, whether it was you know they were doing quality control or uh, they got a degree in distilling or something, something along those lines. Um, we were brand ambassadors. Uh, you know, I was a, a spirits buyer and a chain of retailers in Massachusetts. Um, you know, we basically were we bartender. We basically were doing all the all the customer facing side of the business, um, and so we we actually really developed. I won't just say a passion. We developed kind of a a. Um, Yeah, that's really awesome. I know that a lot of the other brands that are sourcing, you won't get an age statement, you won't get a mash bill, you know, so it's really cool to see those things directly on the bottle. Um, you know, I, I've noticed that uh, they, they, the, uh, uh, the specifically batch six and batch uh, five, you know, are the cask strength whiskey. Do you know if these are done in new or used barrels? Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. I, I can tell you all the barreling. Um, so with batch five, Batch five was the was the only um, was the only uh, two whiskey blend we've done, um, mm -hmm. and it was a very simple blend. It was a very simple concept, to be honest. Um, we wanted to do a weeder, and we mm -hmm. had this really lovely um, uh, set of barrels that were um, eight year old wheat aged exclusively in in New American oak, um, and they were really lovely. Uh, but the, the the tricky part about weeders in general is that wheat tends to be kind of a feisty grain um it's it's pretty it's pretty rough from a mouthfeel standpoint uh, until it ages to a certain point uh, but unfortunately when it hits a certain point of aging um it tends to lose its wheat character i would have totally agree with that the bright minty 
kind of Irish butter uh, uh, notes that we really like in wheat will dissipate over time. Uh, and so bourbon distilleries tend to be in a pickle because if they release the wheat with a high enough wheat content young, um, it can be they can be a little rough. Uh, but if they let it age long enough, um, they often are losing the wheat character. So our thesis was take this really lovely eight-year-old wheat that's in New American Oak that had great, had, had actually really interesting mouthfeel, had great kind of bright wheat characteristics, um, but still, you know, didn't have a really complete profile um, and, and needed to be needed some of the sort of rough edges rounded off of it. Um, and so we blended that with 73% of the blend is 21 year old corn. Um, that corn spent 13 years in um, ex bourbon and then was regaged into new American mm-hmm. oak for, for um, eight plus years. Um, so really it was just a, it was a very straightforward blend of 27% um, eight year old wheat in new oak with uh, 73% 21 year old corn 13 years ex bourbon eight years new oak i was just curious if it had been made in the united states if it would technically be considered bourbon but sounds like it wouldn't because of the no. the early process on the older stuff which makes sense oh so, yeah, yeah. And, and, and yeah bourbon's also an exclusive product of of the united states yeah. so the fact that everything we make is distilled in canada yep. um, yeah exactly along with about 12 other rules that we break um we can't be classified as bourbon yeah <laughs> Uh, but it's you know what honestly particularly in this case it was to our advantage because the the old corn just softens and really rounds out and and stretches out the the wheat character and it almost enhances the wheat character um, yeah I would totally agree with that I, I had this pour and I was absolutely blown away by it um, it was the reason that I had reached out to you because um, I think this bottle is something that can uh, you know rival um, very high end weeders. I would I would put this in the same ballpark as as you know WLW. Um, I need, I haven't tried them next to each other yet, but I plan to because I think this is uh, something that could rival that. I appreciate that. That that's uh, that was in large part our inspiration for making the whiskey. So it's nice to be uh, it's nice to be mentioned in in that uh, in that stratosphere. Yeah, uh, you know, th- there's a lot of other, um, w- most of the other weeders on the market are going to be younger, um, or, um, you know, you get some of the older, like old fit stuff, they're only 100 proof. So getting this at cask strength is really cool too, to have that yeah. older quality to it. Um, yeah, absolutely. So what does the Hungarian oak do to the batch ah. six? I have not tasted the batch six yet. Oh, God, okay. Uh, well, we got to get you a sample first. Oh, well, I got I got it here in front of me. I just haven't I okay, haven't popped okay, it open okay. yet. <laughs> good, good, good. No, um, yeah. So, so we love we love Hungarian oak. We've used it in. Uh, whew, we used it in batch one. We used it in that. Do we use it? In, I don't think we use it. No, I think we used a little. No, no, no. We didn't use it in batch two. We didn't use it in three, but then we used it in four, six, and now seven. Um, we we really like Hungarian oak, um, both on the rye side and on the corn side. So we have some core components that are aged in Hungarian oak, and we have some rye aged in Hungarian oak. And our understanding of of the um, the actual the actual wood profile itself in Hungarian oak is that it's tighter grained but has a really high concentration of wood sugar. Mm. So what does that what, what does that mean? How does that translate into the whiskey? Well, over time, you get this this concentrated um, uh, molasses note, um, and, and so like your classic um, vanillins, which you do get uh, because there is a, a vanillin characteristic to molasses, but the the kind of the kind of uh, more sweet. Um, caramel vanilla profile that you would get from new American oak in Hungarian oak it manifests more as this kind of rich uh, almost uh, darker molasses note Hmm. Uh, but the tight grain um, uh, allows you to get that without um, the requisite uh, kind of uh, bitter woody note that you would usually get from an overaged American um 
done, right? You, 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 you're getting that concentrative effect without over uh, over exposing it to tannin. Yeah, and uh, I wonder if the, the climate in Canada would play a part in that as well. Um, no, I, 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 yeah, and we think about that, and, and it's it's totally it's totally the right question. The fascinating thing is, um, believe it or not, where most barrels are being aged in Canada, because they're not being aged near the Arctic Circle, right? Yeah, so, that's true. <laughs> right, so, so where most of the um, where most of the barrels are being aged, you have a pretty similar temperature cycle to Kentucky. It's hmm. just about ten degrees colder. Okay. All year round, right? So your peaks are ten degrees less, and your troughs are, are ten degrees colder. So you are you are effectively making the the atmosphere a little less reactive and a little less extractive, um, and so you're you are benefiting basically from more oxidation without without getting quite as much without getting quite as much uh, uh, tannin and, and over extraction. Um, but but we definitely you know. The, the the Hungarian oak component in batch six is 26 years old. Um, Whoa! And if you ever drink 26 year old bourbon, um, I, I've I've had the the I wouldn't always say the pleasure, but I certainly would say the privilege of tasting some super old yeah. aged bourbons. Uh, and they do fascinating things, but the cost is that. Is, is unfortunately that kind of pencil, pencil shaving bitterness. Yeah, and almost what the one that I that comes to mind mind is um, I once had Pappy Twenty Three and it reminded me of Dry Vermouth on the ballot. It had like yes, a yes. Um, yeah. So that, that's kind of I what remember, I got out of it. I remember the old blowhard from the Orphan Barrel series, a cool whiskey for sure, but it's like gnawing on a dining room table. I mean, you really <laughs> are. It's mulchy, you know. You're you're yeah. really you're really sucking on wood there, and and, and I you know, um, I I get it because I, you know it's almost like uh, frankly it's almost like old Armagnacs. Old Armagnacs are wonderful, and they have this really cool Roncio f- flavor, and and uh, they they produce some really interesting flavors, um, but they do it at a cost. You 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 have to sort of suffer through a few harsh notes to get at the really interesting um uh lovely sort of overaged notes and that's how i feel often about over uh, you know overage bourbon which is you start to develop profiles that you can only get from having that much exposure to oxygen yeah um, it just comes at a cost yeah it to me it, to me it really feels like there's so many variables that would be hard for someone who's out of the industry to understand because like where you're aging it in the rickhouse can age things so much faster yes. how high it is yes. on the rickhouse how low it is in the rickhouse you know all of those things that that uh you know someone like me who's not in the industry uh, try to piece it all together and uh yeah it's a complicated business for sure the fun thing for us was again like we didn't come from this on the production side, uh, so we were all very knowledgeable about the production process. But there are little aspects of the um, that 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 frankly you only start to really engage with when you start doing them yourself. Um, and so for us, some like just some crazy things that I, I never knew before we started really making the whiskey. And and frankly, appreciated it much more when we were doing it as opposed to when we we're hearing about it. So, mm-hmm. like your your bottling your bottling line matters. If your bottling line forces air through the whiskey as it pushes it into the bottle, versus if it creates a vacuum and sucks it into the bottle, creates a different whiskey. <laughs> and now it's one percent, two percentage points different. It's not like you put them side by side, you know, nine out of 10 people won't be able to tell the difference. But for us, I think one of our big, one of our, I think our, our kind of defining characteristic as whiskey producers is we obsess over the one percentage point because there are 10 different places where you can, I like to say, steal a percentage point, make it 1% better. Now, in that one instance, do you use the, you know the vacuum or 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 kind of the 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 airflow method doesn't matter by itself probably not 
But if you make the whiskey 1% better 10 or 15 times during the whiskey making process, frankly, you're going to end up with a whiskey that is excellent instead of just good. Mm-hmm. And we care about that. Yeah, I need things um, like uh, how you filter it, you know. Um, yes. There's so much to it, you know. It's it's crazy. You know, we, we don't chill filter anything, but there's – you can actually – there, there's like two head filters, five micron, 25 micron, you know, these crazy little differences in filtration make a huge difference. Well, they don't make a huge difference. They make one or two percentage points, yeah. but it's a difference and it keeps, it keeps compiling on itself, you know, how long you let it sit. So if you, you know, one crazy thing is if you simply take whiskey out of a barrel, if you're doing a single barrel and you take whiskey out of a barrel, and you just put it right in glass right away, it doesn't settle, and you, you actually have bottle-to-bottle discrepancy. Yeah, that would if make sense. A, if you put it in a plastic tote, a food-grade plastic tote, for a week, and then you bottle it, you make better whiskey. Hmm. It integrates, it gets way better, because the crazy thing is that the when you pull samples, and we learned this from just pulling samples, pulling, we find that if you pull samples in different parts of the barrel, so the very bottom of the barrel you pull a sample from versus you know, towards the top of the barrel or the middle of the barrel, it's wild how you get these slight differences. And so as you can imagine, when you put it in a food grade tote and it's no longer interacting with the wood and it's no longer interacting with air, it's just kind of settling and, equi- and, and finding a, a point of equilibrium, it will it will settle and get better and get a little bit better. So it's, it's been wild. It's been a, it's been a really fun experience for us over the last couple of years as the most enthusiast whiskey drinkers you could possibly imagine people who worked in the industry for 10 plus years, um, suddenly being on the production side and, and just becoming so enamored with Mm -hmm. and obsessed with these little, spots where you can make the whiskey slightly better knowing that the cumulative effect of doing that has a has a a really a really uh definitive um uh effect on the on the final product it's it's really lovely yeah i've uh, i've had some experience talking to here in town we have a distillery called whiskey del bach they make single malts yeah. And, and talking to their head distiller has really, you know, helped me learn a lot of the process that I never would have known. And aging here in Tucson is, is quite a thing <laughs> uh, because of the, the heat. Um, so it, it's, it's kind of fun to learn, like, all the little details of all the things that they have to do because a lot of their whiskey is pretty young because you, you keep it in the barrels too long. You, you open it up after a few years and half the barrel's gone, you know, <laughs> so, uh, because of how hot it is here. Uh, my uh, my best friend um, my best friend from college was actually uh, stationed at the Air Force Base hmm. in Tucson, um, and and when he would come home to Boston and visit me, uh, he used to actually bring me whiskey Del box. I've, oh, I've, I've awesome! Had a few, I've had a few bottlings. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, they they do some pretty cool stuff. Um, yeah. So, like, how many states are you guys in right now? That's a good question. I I. Um, we're really excited. We we just uh, we started with we basically started with with a self distribution model, mm-hmm. uh, which doesn't mean we got a distribution license. But basically, uh, within the, the sort of alcohol three tier system, uh, oftentimes the wholesaler is responsible for sales, right? Mm-hmm. Going into stores and selling the actual product on top of sort of having the licensing and the, the shipping and all the things that you need to, 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 uh, to distribute your cases around to, to retailers. Um, for us, it didn't make a lot of sense because our product is not easy to convey the message in, um, you know, one minute, which is about mm-hmm. how much time these guys have. Not to mention, you know, distributors these days, big distributors these days have 50 different whiskeys. So how much attention and how much knowledge can they really accumulate about an esoteric product like Found North, um, where, you know, we're a bunch of American guys making a premium Canadian whiskey. It's, it's not it's not really an easy message yeah. to convey. Um, and 
on top of it, there's, you know, there are a lot of hurdles to, to jump with, um, with, with Canadian. Uh, there used to be more hurdles to jump with blended whiskey, but people are starting to realize how important, even within single malt, even within straight bourbon, mm-hmm. the blending process actually is. So blending is kind of, lost a little bit of its former taboo nonetheless we basically need to hand sell our product to accounts across the country that communicate directly with the consumer have mailing lists do tastings um you know tell the stories of the whiskey um and so you know to be to be totally honest in each state there are like 10 to 15 you know, needle moving accounts. Um, mm-hmm. And we find that we have a better opportunity to converse with them directly. So our original approach was um, to, instead of using these full service distributors, we use um, fulfillment partners who basically okay. have the licensing, they can ship your product, but they don't do any of the sales function. They don't go to stores and try to, try to sell stuff. Um, it, it's actually it's better for margins and that probably yeah I was going to say that probably keeps the price down a little bit keeps the price down which is great because you know we can offer 16, 17, 18 year old whiskey at a price that you just you just you won't find in the in in the US categories uh, yeah yeah I mean I know that you know you have some other brands that are doing some like Ex, you know, uh, uh, high end sourcing, you things like Kentucky Owl, Fourgate. You know, they're good whiskeys, but the the high price tag. You know, somebody buys one of them, it, it's it's not worth it to them at that price point. They might not go back to that brand. Um, so right. yeah, and and I know that they're they're you know selling quite a bit younger stuff, but um, I, I, exactly. I mean, I think for us that was that was one of the reasons why we uh, weren't really drawn to being the next four-year-old MGP bourbon yeah. is at, mm-hmm. you know, $89.99 or $100. Bucks. Yeah. Um, so, so all of that being said, we're, we're currently in, um, we're currently in, let's see, uh, Massachusetts, which is our home market where all of us are from, uh, New York, Rhode Island. We just entered New Hampshire and Maine mm-hmm. and we're available in Connecticut um, in a few places, and then we're available in Illinois, which is why I'm. I did see that, yeah, and then uh, California as well. California, mm-hmm. um, we have a handful of stores that carry a few of our products in um, Florida as well, mm-hmm. um, and then we have uh, we have Oregon, and um, and we're really excited. We just started with our first full service distributor, which is. Um, uh, Prestige Latroit, they're phenomenal, okay. um, and they they're one of the. Do you know PM Spirits? PM Spirits is a wholesale wholesale importer okay. um, that that actually speaks directly to the consumer. They okay. move the needle for products in a way that most full distributors can't. We started with them in New York. We start with them in New York um, actually um, in a couple of days on July first. Prestige is just like that. They're kind of the other big distributor. They're actually small, medium-sized distributor um, in the U.S. that that really actually um, has the capability and the and, and the um, really the sales reps are just so talented um, that it's it's worth it to go full service with them. And that will get us into Maryland and um, and. Virginia and DC. Oh, cool! Uh, I know yeah. that um, you're a lot of your a lot of your products are available online though, and a lot of people are buying whiskey online these days. So yeah. I know my my uh, so I have a lot of subscribers in Arizona since I'm based here, but you guys can order them online. They're they're available online. Yes. Um, Sealbox, Sharepour, and our ecom partner uh, Barcart. Um, we basically that covers the rest. Yeah. Um, Oh, and you know what? We just started distribution to Alaska, which is oh, cool. absolutely delightful because our bottle and our kind of our northern uh, theme, as opposed, you know, everything in whiskey these days is like, you know, it's Kentucky, it's Wild yeah. West, it's you know, it's it's horseshoes and 
and it's that it's you know spoken wagons and things like that, right? And, mm-hmm. um, we just tried to lean more into the, the northern aesthetic, mountain snow, you know, mountaineering kind of thing. And so for us, the the fact that um, you know Alaska was eager to get our product is pretty is pretty fun. That's just whether they'll actually move a ton of cases or not is is <laughs> yeah is yet to be seen. But it's a, it's at least fun to be available in Alaska. Yeah, for me, I recall always kind of thinking of Canadian whiskey as being, you know, Crown Royal, 80 proof, um, you know, not, you know, something that's pretty good to mix with, but not something I'm going to pour neat. And then I found a couple years ago, Alberta Premium Cask Strength, and I realized, okay, yeah, these guys know what they're doing. They can make a really good whiskey. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's fascinating. I, I, um, Barrel has done some really good sourcing as well from Canada yes. and their rise. Um, and then there's, I mean, there's a ton of rye. Canadian rye has been pretty successful, actually. Um, but Barrel, Barrel has has done a few. Um, that 24 year they did, um, uh, you know, is it's, it's Canadian and it's it's corn and it's excellent. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, for the most part, you've seen a lot, a lot of um, Canadian rye do well mm-hmm. in the U.S. Though often under the guise of American rye, even though it's, you know, it's sourced from Canada. Yeah, I mean, uh, one of the most popular ryes on the market, I mean, like highly sought, highly rated uh, barrel seagrass, you know, that one's going to be, it's a blend of, um, I want to say MGP and Canadian rye, but yep. that is, yeah, with point. those fun finishes on it, you know, people love that bottle. Oh, yeah, so, so we, we um, I think we, you know, we get the question all the time, um, why, you know, why, why are one, why are us as Americans, you know, making Canadian whiskey, um, but also, you know, why aren't Canadian brands making more whiskeys like ours? Mm. Um, and it's a fascinating, it's a fascinating uh, a little quirk in the industry. And and the, the kind of the way I like to describe it is when you think about the super premium American whiskeys, right? You think about, you know, Four Roses Small Batch Limited mm-hmm. Edition. You think of the the um, antique collection. You think of um, Parker's you know, Heritage, Park- maybe. Yeah, Bur- Bar- Parker's Heritage Birthday Bourbon. You know what? What is the point of making these whiskeys? Because when you consider when you consider the volume that they're doing, mm-hmm. you know, these are brands that are doing hundreds of thousands of cases why put so much energy so much marketing and and uh and so much you know uh, uh labor into producing a whiskey that you're gonna make three to ten thousand bottles <laughs> of which in the grand scheme of things is a drop in the bucket for these guys honestly it's a loss leader i, I don't actually think they effectively make money on these whiskeys yeah. and the obvious answer is that it creates a halo effect right people who've had people who've had small batch limited edition from four roses appreciate the craftsmanship that goes into making that that blend that goes into making you know the 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 incredible whiskey that is oh, yeah. small batch limited edition and it gives them the ability to make small batch and small batch select and it gives them the the ability to make that at at a much higher volume and maybe sell each of those products for a dollar or five dollars more which ends up translating into an astoundingly large number (laughs) when it comes to the the profitability of their brand and so the the effect of the of the super premium whiskey is to make a really kind of beneficial halo for the rest of the whiskey um and so it's it's really the big distilleries it's all about volume and finding ways to increase volume and and enhance the 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 brand recognition well one sort of secret i guess uh, pretty sort of secret in plain sight when it comes to canadian whiskey is that they have absolutely no problem selling volume to us to us Americans, yeah. they, the the number one selling whiskey in the United States from 1865 until 2010 was Canadian 
from yeah. a volume standpoint. Uh, we think about these, like, we think about the, the quote-unquote whiskey renaissance that's going on right now. We, we look at different categories, like the rye category over the last 20 years. We look at Irish whiskey category over mm-hmm. the last 20 years. You know, those categories were starting at nothing, and now, you, you know, as a category, rye is selling I don't, I, I don't know the exact number for 2022, but I know when I looked at it a few years ago, it was close to 2 million cases in the United States, whereas in 2000, it was, you know, 100,000 cases or something like that. Something yeah, something that, very a small. Just minuscule, like, goofy small number. Irish whiskey, the same. It was like they were doing less than a million cases in 2000 in the United States. And Probably most ago, of was, that was Jameson. <laughs> yeah, all of that, right? <laughs> ago I saw it was like 7 million cases right so you look at these categories and rightfully so people are talking about their astonishing growth well take a look at Canadian whiskey in 2000 Canadian whiskey was selling 15 million cases in the United States in 2020 they were selling 20 million cases in the United States they are and that doesn't include by the way you know things like fireball which they make that's right right? (laughs) that doesn't include nor does that include all of the stuff that's sourced from Canada and then sold as American whiskey. That counts as the American whiskey category, not the Canadian whiskey category, um, even though it's all made there, hmm. right? Interesting. So, Canadian whiskey, they don't have to create a halo effect. They're already selling yeah. tens of millions of cases at an astounding profit. Uh, and because of the... the um, because of the, the sort of mediocre reputation of Canadian whiskey as a category, you know, they're discontinuing Alberta premium, right? Like they, they're, <laughs> they, when they enter, even with a great product like Alberta premium, um, it, they, they, it, it often doesn't sort of catch, um, you know, it just doesn't, it doesn't really catch on here because nobody thinks of it as, sort of a premium category. They think Crown, they think Canadian Club, they think Black Velvet, uh, if they think Canadian or yeah. And so for us, it, it it's a good and a bad thing because there's this big hole <laughs> uh, um, that we're happy to, to, to fill with super high quality, really, you know, well-made, we, we obviously think we blend it well, but, but actually well-distilled and well-aged whiskey uh, that's that that we can blend, um, and that that has astoundingly good value. Uh, Definitely, and, and we can kind of fill that that hole. Um, the the other side of the the other edge of the sword, of course, is that um, we have to do a lot of educating. We have to do a lot of sampling. We have to get get the whiskey in people's glasses, um, and. Um, you know, break up some of the the misconceptions around Canadian. Yeah, uh, which which we like doing. Yeah, and I think you guys are doing a very good job of that. I, the product speaks for itself. Um, so, I, so far, I've tried two of them, and I think they uh, you guys knocked it out of the park. So that, the two I've tried are the batch three, the seventeen year rye, um, and I went ahead and uh, I went ahead and tasted it blind against uh, Michter's barrel proof rye, and I chose that one because it's one of my favorites, and it was a similar proof. And I preferred the Found North. I oh, um, appreciate that. Um, and, you know, I mean, I, I get it. The Michters is younger. But, uh, you know, I thought it was a fair comparison since they're both Rise and they're both around the same proof. But, um, yeah, I, I'm really curious to try the Batch 5 against some other heavy hitters in the weeder, the weeder market and, and see how it, ter- how it stacks up because I think it's going to do really well. Uh, well, I'm excited for you to taste Batch 6 as well. And yeah. I got to get... I gotta get um, I got to get batch seven out to you. Um, oh yeah, that'd be awesome. Up, which comes out next week. Um, well, it comes out today in uh, in Illinois. Okay. Uh, but that's just a uh, that's a that's a Binnie's Binnie's is a is a, an incredible retail chain in Illinois, and they have their big World of Whiskey event literally today. Oh awesome! Um, so it didn't make it, we're out here, so it didn't make much sense to to. To stall the launch <laughs> in in Illinois for a week, um, and and miss out on the opportunity to to, uh, to pour these uh, this new whiskey here. So 
Um, yeah, I've, I've heard really good things about Benny's, actually. I hear they uh, um, are a, a very good chain. I hear they're fair with their, like, lottery-type drawings, and they do excellent store picks. So. They do a wonderful store pick. Uh, honestly, I'm, as somebody who's worked in retail, the, the thing that they do, and this is going to sound so goofy, but the thing that they do insanely well, which is I can't begin to tell you how difficult it is to manage, um, is their inventory is always accurate. Like, if you go on their website and they say they have three bottles of X thing, they have three bottles of that thing at that store. And when you're managing 30-plus stores and you can keep your inventory right, because, like... That is impressive. This is, this is so in the weeds, and I apologize, but having worked in retail and, like, you get your inventory right and within a week it's wrong again. Oh, yeah. Uh, that, the you know... Distilleries do dumb things like reusing barcodes. <laughs> so, you know, you scan in a new product, and of course, in your system, that barcode is some old product, so immediately your inventory's up. Yeah, so I've, I've even seen that affect pricing where you'll some people will share pictures. They go into a store and they're landing like a four rows of single barrel barrel proof for the same price as four rows of single barrel because they're reusing barcodes. It's the same you'd be seeing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, uh, no, they're incredibly well run. They, they're incredibly fair, and and frankly, um, uh, Brett and uh, and Pat, the, the guys who run their whiskey program, um, are just out of this world knowledgeable. Um, truly, truly expert. Um, I've, I've I've met very few people um, in the whiskey industry who are as knowledgeable, particularly because they're you know. It's one thing to know, you know, Canadian whiskey really well or, you know, bourbon really mm-hmm. well. But when you're managing the entire whiskey department, to be able to, to sort of know the craft industry, to know the, the bulk industry, to know, um, you know, 10 different categories of whiskey, be it, you know, Irish, Scottish, yeah, that's a challenge. Japanese, they're, these guys just know their, they, they know their stuff. It's really impressive. Yeah, that, that is a real challenge. Um... Well, I, 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 uh, I better uh, uh, cut this one. Uh, I really appreciate you coming on and, and sharing some about the brand. I, I, I plan to use these in several videos because I, I'm, I just really want to speak the good word of Found North. I think you guys are doing really good stuff. Um, so thanks, Drinking Buddies, for listening, and uh, uh, we'll see you on the next one.